Hello everyone and welcome to Blue Tengu's live game development show, broadcasting from Scuba Japan, where we show everything that goes into making a game from concept to completion. If you've ever wanted to make a game, we hope this will help lower the barrier to entry, maybe give you the nudge needed to try it yourself. Uh, even if you don't want to make a game, we hope you'll find some value in what we're doing here. Uh, all of the information about where you can find us is in the Twitch info down below, or in our YouTube profile for those of you catching us later, but just in case, we're at www.bluetengu.com, uh, btengu on Twitter, Facebook.com Blue Tango Studio, YouTube.com Blue Tango Studio for those of you watching this, uh, the live stream right now, and uh, Twitch TV for those of you watching us later on YouTube. If you missed any episodes, you can always catch them over at YouTube, but you shouldn't have any trouble following along even if you haven't seen them. Uh, welcome to any of you who might be joining us after hearing about the show at GDC. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show on Twitch or YouTube before, my name's Eric. I'm a game designer living over here in Japan. Uh, who's trying to show you everything that goes into making a game for two hours a week, roughly, including all the ums and ahs and awkward debugging moments. Uh, the reason I'm showing it all, as opposed to making the game first and scripting out a rehearsed tutorial, is because I do want to lower that barrier. I think if you see me kind of struggling with some concepts, you don't feel so bad when you have the same thing happen to you. And probably most people won't struggle as much as I do, so that's one possible way to motivate you guys. And uh, thank you to everyone who dropped by two weeks ago for the extra long uh, pre-GDC episode to make up for the fact that it'd be gone last week. And uh, thank you for your patience and letting me go off to GDC. Uh, for those of you here with me on Twitch, uh, feel free to drop suggestions or ask questions at any time. I may not be able to answer them right away because I am working, but I'll try to get to them. And if I can't, please send me a private message here, leave a comment on our site or YouTube video, or you can send an email to like, eric at bluetengu.com. And I'll do my best to address it next time. That's Eric with a C, by the way, just in case. Uh, and if any of you are out there making something on yourself and you don't mind showing it off, send me a link. Love to see it. Uh, if it's during the live show, maybe may even jump over it to it because I get easily distracted, and I've done that a couple of times. At this time, every week for two hours, I do come on to Twitch TV to work on the game Project Spaghetti for this season anyway, uh, which is a top-down 2D cowboy shooter where the bullets fired bounce around the screen with a pinball mechanic. Uh, two weeks ago, in that extra long episode we did in preparation for missing uh, uh, TDC, got the game over sequence working with everyone lining up to go to the outhouse, as well as getting a lot of stats tracked behind the scenes. They don't show up yet in the results screen, but they will be used later in that, I think. But uh, this week, I think uh, Pandavitz was the one who uh, picked the next task, but, uh, and Pandavitz is in the chat right now, uh, doing his best on uh, some Unreal stuff, so I wish you luck with that. Uh, sometimes it can be tricky. So, uh, at, that, at his suggestion, we are going to go with the coin implementation. Uh, up to now, we've left points a relatively passive process. When you shoot an enemy, uh, you just get points for it. Um, yeah, obviously, if the enemies shoot each other, you just get points for that. It doesn't make you really hustle for the points. Obviously, you have to shoot them. There's some skill involved, etc., but I think we can, you know, bump it up, bump that gameplay up a little bit by making people actually have to work for those points. And the way to do that is probably to actually have the enemies drop coins. So unless you collect those coins within a certain amount of time or whatever, taking the risk of dodging bullets and stuff as you go, uh, you don't get the points. So um, it should be interesting. But uh, before I go any further, since some of you guys may be new to this, uh, I should probably show you where I'm at in the project right now. So I'll jump over to that. Uh, let's see, get to my desktop. And uh, Jim Orange so stops by as well, so hi Jim. Uh, thank you for stopping by, and I'm glad I could see you at, uh, during GDC. It was good to, good to see you again. And Bone Crusher stops by. Bone Crusher mentions he can't hear anything. Uh-oh. Why is that happening? Whoop. Let's try setting the mic to 100%. Uh, Cirrus drops by as well, so hi Cirrus. Well, let's see. Audio's good on my... Okay, so I guess it's... It's with Bone Crushers. So everyone can hear except Bone Crusher. I'm sorry. Um... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim, for mentioning that. I guess it could be... The muted ad thing that's killing the stream. Yeah, thank you guys for helping me out. I, if, I hope you guys can help Bone Crusher figure out his uh, volume problem. I am going to jump 
into the game so I can show it to you guys, but I hope, Bone Crusher, I hope the audio does kick in for you, although you couldn't hear me say I hope the audio kicks in for you, unless the audio kicks in. Uh, sorry. So, okay, let's jump over to the desktop here. All right, uh, so what I use to make the game is Game Maker. Uh, you know, there's plenty of options for 2D games now. At GDC, it was announced Unreal Engine would be free. Well, uh, free to use, I suppose. It still has that 5% charge on, you know, the games you make or whatever. But, you know, that's 5% of the profit and you get a whole engine to work with. So that's not bad at all. And I think Unity 5, uh, they also made the standard version, I think, free recently. So I think as long as it's up to $100,000 in profit, it's free. But then if you pass that, you have to buy the professional license. But that's fair. Fair enough. Uh, so the engines are definitely, the competition is heating up. But I still use Game Maker because uh, I think for my, well, at least for this game anyway, uh, since it is kind of a retro Commodore 64 game, style. It's 2D. It's probably overkill to do anything in Unreal or uh, even Unity. So Game Maker is perfect for what I want to do. At GDC, I got to meet Tom Francis, who's the person who inspired me to use Game Maker. Uh, he was giving a talk about, uh, let's see, gunpoint and knowing when to, you know, get how to work on that last, that last, you know, bit of game. Uh, it was awesome to see him because he is very cool. For those of you who don't know him, uh, or Gunpoint, he was um, he used to be a journalist over in the UK, a game journalist, but in his spare time, like only weekends, he worked in Game Maker and made the game Gunpoint, which is awesome. And, you know, he made it all on his own, put a video up, well, at least I learned this at the talk, he put a video up, uh, got an artist to jump on, made it look better, and then put another video up and got an audio designer to jump on and make the sound and music and stuff, so very very happy for him. But let's jump into uh, Project Spaghetti. So this is the game. I need to shrink this window so I know that I'm not going off the screen because I have an old monitor so uh, things tend to drop off at the bottom because I am broadcasting in 16.9 even though my monitor is just a square. So let me try to get this so that I can be aware of where that bottom part is. So about to there. Seems safe. So here's Project Spaghetti. Um, <clears throat> let me check the chat. I hope you, hope Bone Crusher got it helped, uh, got it fixed here. Do, 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 do. Okay, and Petabits also shared some texture maps, so I'm going to have to grab that link before it scrolls off the chat here. Uh, let's see. Grr.com. And O T H S I G F. Okay, and I'll keep that to the side for now, but um, just so, just so I have the link so it doesn't scroll off in the chat. But Bone Crusher looks like uh, the the audio is working for him. So good. Thank you guys for your help. Thank you. I think Jim and some of the other people in the chat helped out with that. So uh, let's get started on the game. So, a couple of weeks ago, I started on the intro sequence, so it's just a simple Ready, tutorial intro. Set, where you just teaches you how to shoot, shows you the ducking mechanic, then it shows that you can do the ducking thing. And once you start moving, enemies start showing up, as they always did. So here's where the pinball mechanic works. You kind of bounce it off the edges, and the more it bounces around, you'll see it soon, some of the bullets start changing color there. As they pick up color, they go faster, and if they hit enemies, they're worth more points. Like right there, it was three times 100 because the bullet was going fast enough. So, uh, that's the thing we're going to be changing today. Instead of just getting those points automatically, you're going to have to go and grab them. And there's other levels too. Um, it's not just fighting bad cowboys. There's like a graveyard level where if you try to shoot the ghosts, the bullets go right through them. But if you ring the bell, they get upset. They start charging you, but you can shoot them. And I need to get some health before I die here. There we go. Just to keep it simple. 
and other levels. Uh, I think this is from last November or so, made the desert level with scorpions. If you shoot them from the front, all it does is make them upset to charge you. And have to run. So this forces you to use the pinball mechanic a little more than the other stages, because you have to get it behind them to kill them. Uh, of course, the other strategy is just to fire a lot of bullets and hope that one of them hits. Die there, so I'll skip the level. Obviously, this is one of the more difficult levels. Uh, the next one's the UFO level. Uh, these aliens are sh completely shielded. Oops. Unless you can get the lasers reflecting off of crystals to break their shields, and then you can shoot them. So that's that mechanic. Uh, let's skip too far ahead. This is the Christmas level where snowmen are chasing after you. If they still have their head, they can see you, so they chase after you, and the smaller they get, the faster they get, so the more dangerous they get. But if you take their head off, if I can do that. If you take their head off, let's see, come on. Then they still get faster, but they can't see you anymore, so they can't chase you. And there's also a boss level here where a giant version of the bad cowboy shows up. So, what I'm going to get started on is making coins for them to drop, and just a quick warning for you guys today, I do have a doctor's appointment that unfortunately has to be at 10.30, so I have to basically wrap up probably around like 9.45 or so, and then just run off to that. So it's going to be a little shorter today. Thankfully, I think coins shouldn't be too hard to implement. <clears throat> Uh, but before I get started on this, let me jump over to see Pandavid's texture there. Let's see. Does it jump up? Ah, oh, okay. Nice. Let me, let, me, let me get some more information about what's going on here. Since I think you guys are, are chatting out here. Uh, let's see. And Cirrus mentions wouldn't mind using Unreal uh, for free. And let's see. I love how Twitch keeps jumping it to the bottom for me, so I'm going to jump over to this one here. So <laughs> it's going to be weird because I'm going to be watching myself and into this weird mirror thing. But Let's see if Twitch could not do this. So Blender's not really user-friendly. User okay, so PandaBits uh, is using... A Let's see. PandaBits. Thank you. Let's see, Blender. So PandaBits, are you... Oh, you're using 3ds Max. Okay, so yeah, Blender. Um, I did try to... Wow, this is getting weird. Okay, so uh, I guess PandaBits using 3ds Max instead of Blender. Yeah, I can understand that because I tried to use Blender to make like models and things and do texture maps and I followed the tutorials and got it working but it is a little bit of a hassle but it is free and for example like editing all of these videos I use Blender because it's it's got a little bit of everything in it. And Pandabits mentioned that the the texture here, oh uh, not there, here is on the Pokeball yeah, good job on the texture. Is it is it actually working? Uh, but it doesn't look like it. Put so many textures on one model. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be able to catch up to the chat a little bit here, so... Put up... Put up so many textures on one model that every time I load up the model it would crash. Okay, so Pandavit's still working on it a little bit, so still getting it to work. I hope I hope by the time I finish, you're already finished with your thing. So let's jump over to... I guess we have to make the coins first, so uh, jump into Photoshop and do that first. Let's see. It's taking a little while for my coffee and donuts to kick in here, plus I've got to take allergy medicine because it's horrible over here in Japan right now with the cedars. 
so I might be a little fuzzed out. Let's hope let's hope I can uh, pull it together for the show though. So Project Spaghetti, I think this is where I keep all my graphics, like the original Photoshop files. In terms of size, um, coins would probably be about the size of like the drops. Bullet cactus drops present. So it seems like icons. I don't bullet drop. Yeah, let's go with this for a base. So like the bullets in the game are this size. Like when you pick up new bullets that en enemies drop, they're about this size. So coins would probably be around this. Um, hmm. Image size. So 16 by 20 pixels. Yeah, let's let's use this as a base. Um, I can always change the size later. Let's just call it coin. That's easy enough. It's not really going to be an icon, so I don't want to call it an icon. Uh, probably do want to animate it a little bit so it's not just sitting there, but uh, that's something I can do after I get it working, I suppose. So first thing to do is to bring the Commodore 64 palette over here. Uh, hopefully that brought it up. Nope. Try again. Well, it's bringing it up somewhere, I suppose. View. Window range. There we go. It was just hidden somewhere. Because I'm trying to keep it in the top half of the screen so you guys can see it. Don't want to forget that. So, let's see. A standard coin color would obviously be like a yellow, but uh, the problem is it is in the desert. So, if I did do a yellow color, the problem would be it would get lost. Because it would just be yellow on this, which would not be any good. So maybe using red as a base is the way to go. And then just kind of applying some tints to that afterwards. So let's try red. See how that goes. And let's fill in the whole thing first. Oop. What is going on here? Oh, I'm not sure why it's doing that. It should just be filling, but okay, I guess I have to do this the hard way. All right, that's round at least. Probably could narrow it a little bit. Okay, that should get me started. I mean, it's obviously very simple, but... Yeah, this is the problem with a limited color palette. There's not a lot I can do to give it kind of an outline, but... Nah, I'll just I'll leave it simple for now. Let's get the gameplay working first. So, there we go. My, my red blob is my coin. worry about animation and stuff like that later. Let's get the actual system working first. So icons, yeah, let's put it in there. So icons, coin, just remember where it is and bring it in. So that is a pickup, so let's bring it in here. Uh, duplicate that, call this sprite coin, and bring in the other one. Just check the size here, 8 by 10 in here. Sixteen by twenty. Okay, so uh, it's probably twice as big as I need. So I do need to shrink it down. Let's go fifty percent. Okay, that's quite small, but it works. So that's sprite coin. And let's see. And Cirrus mentions yes, I got donuts. Yes, I did get donuts. And decent scrimp drops by. Hey, old scrimp. Yeah, I wouldn't be too jealous if he has Mr. Donut. Well, I did have Mr. Donut, but 
uh, Mr. Donuts, a chain over here in Japan that sells donuts, but I did get the honey old-fashioned, not the regular old-fashioned. The regular old-fashioned, I'm not sure who likes those from Mr. Donut, but they're dry as a bone. They basically suck all the moisture out of your mouth, but the honey old-fashions are actually really good, so that's my addiction, honey old-fashioned donuts here. But I'm sure Decent Scrimp is jealous of my donut situation. All right, let's jump into the objects. By the way, I did miss you guys last week. I mentioned it in the post and stuff, but it was really, it felt really weird not being able to do the show last week because I've been doing it for, you know, 35 weeks straight um, until last weekend. But thank you for your patience on that. So let's items pick up. Use one of these as a base coin. I hope daylight savings time didn't throw too many of you off, uh, because if you're springing forward, I guess the show starts an hour later than you would expect. So there's probably probably a few people that dropped by and saw nothing happening and thought, oh, they're not doing it today. Hope hope most of you well most of you guys did seem to show up, so I don't think you had too much of a problem there. So the parents, the pickup coin, there we go. And pickup. Yeah, so all the pickup parent class for these items, like the bullet drop, the health drop, the things that have been dropping so far, uh, the parent class has been able to control most of that. Uh, sets like an item life so that they do disappear over time. Probably want to use the same timing uh, for the coins because if players are used to the time it takes for things to disappear, it probably makes sense to keep them used to it, not give them any surprises. And let's see, that seems okay. So I'm probably going to have to do something in player. That must be where I'm handling all of those collisions inside of here. Yes, okay. So when the player collides with a bullet drop or a health drop, this is where I'm making the changes. So I'm going to have to add a collision event to here for when they run into the coin and do stuff. Pick up the coin, add it to the score. So let's see. Easy way to do that is probably just score. I think there is a score object here, enemy score. That's just for drawing it, I think. I think for now what I'll do is I'll keep points coming in for, for the player when they do hit the enemy, but I will also have them getting points from the coins, and then I can worry about getting rid of the automatically getting points later. So just have it where if you collect a coin, you get more points. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Let's make the base maybe 100. And I think I'm using score. So score, score plus 100. Let's try that. And so now the only thing I need to do is make the enemies drop coins. That's going to be interesting. That's got to be an enemy. Where am I doing the score stuff? When they hit a bullet, spawn score holder. So I could probably do the coin drop inside of this enemy score object that I've had going. That might be a way to do it. Keep it simple. So when it's created, Let's see, let's keep it easy for now, just to make sure it's working. Um, let's just make it create a coin object where it drops at X and Y. And let's see how this works. Uh, just to make, just to keep it as simple as possible, make sure it works and then start working from there.
and Pandabits is working on fixing the hilarious problem of malformed textures. Wow. I, I do not envy you because I do not like working <laughs> with textures at all. It's one of those things where it, it's, it probably needs a lot more work in terms of me actually going in there and practicing with textures and things like that rather than just following the tutorials and making them. Never really kind of got my head around that stuff, so I do not envy that. Ready, set. So these guys should drop coins as well, I think. Because they do give points. Yes, so there is a coin. It looks horrible, obviously. But it's supposed to. It's also gigantic. But there we go, the coin does disappear. Let's see what happens when I get it. My score is currently 600. Went up to 700. Okay, so coins are working. That's good. It even made a proper coin pickup sound, so that's cool. Uh, but it's obviously boring if just every enemy drops one coin. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out a way to make different enemies that are worth different points drop a different amount of coins. And let's see. There's also going to be the multiplier, so even a basic enemy, if they're hit with a really fast like red bullet, they're going to drop 1,000 points worth of coins. So probably need different levels of coins too. Let's see, where am I doing something where I'm changing the tint? Image alpha, image blend. I think there is something in Game Maker called image blend that I can use. Blend. Game maker. to just kind of change the basic color a little bit, just add a little bit of different color to it. Yeah, exactly this. Image blend. Okay, so you can make the color here. Let's just try and experiment with it to make sure this, this does work the way I expect it to. Um, where can I do this? I guess I could do it in coin. Add events, create. Just to give it a shot. Image blend, and I think I can use the Commodore 64 colors that I have going. So global C64. Do I call it purple? All those globals are in script settings persistent, I think. Yes, okay, I do call it uh, global C64 purple. That's that purple color there in RGB values. So next time the coin shows up, it should be purple. Let me just check that. And NeoZoom drops by. Hello. Uh, welcome to the show. We're just getting started uh, getting coins in the game for players to pick up. And you'll see a little bit of how the game's working when I'm testing this uh, coin feature. Ready, set, draw. Now, if everything works, they should drop something somewhat purple. It won't be exactly purple. <laughs> okay, it's... Purple-ish, I suppose. Uh, at least at the edges. No, not really. It it looks different, but it's not enough. I would hate to have to make a whole bunch of sprites for that, but may have to think about that. I was hoping to get away with blend because then. Uh, let's stop this. I was hoping to get away with blend because there's only a certain number of colors that I can use on these backgrounds because, as you can see, I can't really use yellow or brown. Uh, I can't really use yellow or brown because that would just blend in with that. And with the graveyard level, again, can't use the brown stuff. So, I think that's all I use. Oh yeah, and then the light blue. Can't use that one because it would just disappear in the snow level. So in terms of, you know, available color palette, I don't have a lot to work with. Um, so I was hoping to use blend to give the color the the coins a little bit of a different tint to them, so you would know they were different values. But that does not seem to be doing 
as much as I would expect. Hmm. Please no matter. Either have no draw event. Yeah, red is a strong color, so maybe that's part of the problem. Let me try. Let me just try gray. Let's see if I can tint this actually. And I'll use the American spelling as opposed to the fantasy spelling, the British fantasy spelling from fantasy books. Let me bring that one in. Load sprite coin gray. Edit it, shrink it down. And let's see if the purple tint kind of works on this. It'd be nice if it did, because I wouldn't. There's only so many colors I can use, so. If I need to have three or four different coin types, it's going to be kind of tricky. I mean, I'll have to make an outline for it, things like that. It would be nice to keep it simple, because then it'll be easier to animate, too. Okay. Well, it is showing up as purple. Um, because it is a blend, it's just throwing the purple on top of the gray. Uh... Mm, yeah, it, it is working, but it is cheating in a way, too, because it's blending colors, so that color does not exist on the Commodore 64, because it's this combination of this dark gray and the purple. So as you can see in Photoshop, that's a pretty light purple, but because it's being blended with this gray, it turns into a dark purple. That's cheating. I can't, I can't do that. So what I'm going to do is maybe... Maybe, maybe, maybe make it white. It'd be, and just keep the, the edges maybe grayish. It's still going to be a little bit of cheating, but it might be okay. So let me try just making it white. Oh, I don't want to save the PDF yet. Save as PNG. But it does basically just take me back to where I was, where I only have a certain number of colors to use. But there we go. Those are the rules I set out for myself, so those are the rules I have to follow. It, it does have to look like it belongs on a Commodore 64, except for, you know, effects and particles and things like that, so. Here we go. Edit, squash it down. At the very least, using this blend will save me the work of having to do a whole bunch of sprites and animating them all separately. Let's just make sure this works. Let's make sure it shows up the proper purple color. Ready, set, draw. By the way, NeoZoom, if you're still around, how did you uh, happen upon the show? Did you just find it in Twitch, or did you hear about it somewhere? I'm always curious about that stuff because I always wonder how you guys like happen upon the show I'm sure most of it is check just kind of looking around for game dev and twitch but some of you guys may have happened upon it somewhere else so let's see yeah it's showing up properly that is the right purple so I guess I'll go with that at least I only have to use one coin object so I can get it to turn around and stuff but the colors I think I'm safe to use are probably purple, green, mostly the bullet colors, I would think, because the bullet has to stand out against the background. So whatever I'm using for bullet colors should theoretically be okay. Maybe if I put a gray edge around it. Yeah, the gray is going to cause a little bit of cheating, but I guess let's try it. Just to make sure it stands out a little bit. So now I gotta edit this white blob here. I 
Okay, so it will overlap the gray a little bit, make a color that doesn't exist on the Commodore 64. But I think it's kind of required because the uh, the bullet does it too. I might think of a way to do it where it's the gray edge is just a separate object or a separate sprite. I'll have to think about that because I don't want to cheat. I really don't want to cheat. Because as you can see, like with the bullet, the bullet icon, it has that gray base. And obviously allergies are causing my voice to disappear on me. I am chatty, so that's probably part of it. Oh, PandaBits, thank you for telling me about this. So uh, PandaBits read an article on Kotaku back in October about game dev on Twitch, and that's what caused you to check it out. And I guess I just happened to be on when you were looking around, so that's cool. Yeah, because um, I think Twitch added the game game development uh, you know tag for broadcasting about that time because originally I was just always broadcasting it with Project Spaghetti, which is the name of the game, obviously. But you know who knows what that is. So uh, there weren't a lot of people dropping by, but when I switched to the game development tag that Twitch had, I think that's when I finally started to find a couple of you guys. So I'm happy that Twitch did do that for us, because, you know, who wants to see something about a game that you've never heard about? So having a game development tag helps, because otherwise, you know, you don't know if the person's playing it, making it, what they're doing. But thank you for letting me know how you found, found the show. Ready, set, draw. Oops, I forgot to shrink the coin down. But, okay, there we go. There's the coin. It is purple. Let's shrink that thing down so it's not gigantic. Okay, there we go. And it's centered again. Uh, so that gives me my basic coin to work, look, work with. Let's change the color based on the point value. I suppose would be the next thing. So I need to pass that in. On zero to increment. Yes, score. Multiplier. So um, yes, score is the base score, and yes, multiplier is the multiplier. So I could probably pass in some of these. Okay, so let's try. Let's keep it simple for now, as I always do. I'll throw a variable in there. Let's change the coins variable. Let's say coin score. And let's just put it at yes score times yes multiplier. We'll worry about multiple coins later. So that should do that. And I need to make a variable called coin score inside of coin. Default it coin score. Just default it to zero, I guess, for a start. And then when the player collides with that, they need to add that point value instead of just 100. So jumping over to player, collide with the coin. And set this to coin score, other, other score, there we go, other coin score. So the thing it collides with, that coin score is what gets added to the player's score. So let's make sure that works first. Yeah, very weird. My my stream is showing like the, well, at least to the side, it's showing like the starting soon logo for some reason. I guess my uh, my feed froze on me on my laptop here, which I used to check the chat, by the way, which is why my head is always turned this way when I'm talking to you guys. It's unfortunate, but I don't have a large monitor, so I kind of have to 
sneak sneak peeks off to the side to see what you guys are talking about. Let me just make sure Twitch is working in here. Yes. Ready? Okay. Good. <laughs> just had to check. It's just it's just with the the laptop, I guess. Ah, uh, yes. Score does not know what that is. Okay. Ah, uh, yes, score times multiplier. Yes, score times multiplier. Why would it not know what that is? Because it's right there. Ah, okay. Got it. Yeah, I'm going to have to use scripting for this because what's happening is because I'm saying this applies to object coin, it's looking for ES score and ES multiplier inside of coin. Okay, so we do have to do scripting. Go figure. Try to use the Game Maker UI stuff for doing things, and it just never works out. So I always have to jump back to script. All right, so let's uh, instance create. Let's do all the instance stuff in here. So create that coin, add X and Y, and coin ID. Keep track of it. So now I can say coin ID. Coin score is equal to ES score times ES multiplier, which is what I wanted to do up there. So get rid of that. Lesson learned. Uh, just start with script. Yeah, trying to use the UI stuff just never seems to work out. And right. kind of its mentions looks right. like going to make each right. object's texture independently and then apply them. Ooh, that's that's extra work. And Neozim mentions why don't you use GM Maker control GML code instead of D and D buttons? Helps a lot when you're getting into more complex games like yours. Uh GM Maker control GML code. Instead of D and D buttons. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure I'm following you. Um, so what you're saying is, well, let's go back to my example here. I guess I'm. I want to know what you mean by control code. Because right now, let's see, we've got coin. That's not that one. It's enemy score. So are so Neozoom, Are you saying? doing something besides like throwing the script inside of these events and actions or is this what you were talking about yeah, there might have just been lag or something because i jumped to using this uh just let me know because i'm curious if there's better ways to do things in game maker especially like you said this is a very complicated project now so having to jump around is a little more difficult so control code if it, if it does help then i would definitely want to know about it would definitely appreciate that Okay, duck. Duck. Okay, let's pick this up. So that should be worth a couple of points. Okay, so that should be worth 400 points. Yeah, it was worth 400 points, so I just forgot to add which is not good. Uh, I need to add. Yes, so score plus coin score. And just player score. No, it seems to be OK. It seems to figure out what score is. I guess it's just a global, so it's fine. Let's try that again. Because it was just resetting my score, which was obviously not what I wanted. Ready, I add it. Set. Okay, so sh theoretically I should get nine six hundred now. One hundred. Now it's not actually adding anything, so there again I think we have to use some scripting instead of the GUI stuff.
All right, so add to the score, add the coin value to the score. Equals. I think I can get away with that in Game Maker. Always forget. Uh, so other dot coin score. Seems to be all right. Make sure that works. Okay, and NeoZim helped give me the explanation here, so let me catch up with that. So drag and drop all those variable buttons. You can just code in a simple file, execute piece of code like this. You can do everything in there, like declare variables. I basically only use create, step, and draw events, then all code. It's way easier to organize bigger things. And uh, NeoZim says what I mean is that you can do all of that you did, but with even better control using the always execute piece of code thing. Yeah, yeah, you, you are right. Um, because a lot of these things have kind of turned into that over time. Like you, well, this is all just variable stuff. But yeah, you could theoretically not have to do all these, like, variable controls out here. You could put an inside of code, comment them nice and cleanly, rather than having kind of this mess that's out here and having to search through it. I think, yeah, using script in general is probably where I'm going to start evolving to over time. Like if I started another project, I think I would probably go more heavily into just using scripts on everything. Because, yeah, the, the GUI interface is easy to use, but like you said, it doesn't give you the control you need over things sometimes, and it's just, it's hard to kind of work your way through it sometimes. So it's it's a positive and a mind negative at the same time. But thank you for describing that. I do appreciate it. Right. It's something I'll have to think about. Switching from all the drag and drop stuff to scripting. Because I always end up scripting anyway. All right, let's see if it heads to the score properly this time. No. Wow. Okay. So it might actually be a problem inside of coin. Coin score zero. Enemy score. Create coin. It might be this stuff that's not working properly. What can I do to fix this. Let me try show debug message. Let's just make sure there is a value going into here. First off, because it could just be zero. That might be what's causing the problem. Okay, something's going on there. It's been two weeks, so I might have been slipping on my Game Maker scripting here. Let's see, Game Maker, create coin, show debug message, that's fine. Coin ID score, so this is probably not working the way I expect it to. Oh, pff, duh. Okay. Yeah, I am getting rusty. String. Yeah, forgot to do that. Change it to a string so it actually knows what to do with it. Uh, I've been using VBA the last two weeks to do something else, so I think that's kind of infecting my mind a little bit when it comes to the scripting, too. Just forgot to cast it as a string. Uh, so Ready, if it works right, there should set. be a bug message down there. Coin score zero. So yes, it is zero. That is not good. So I think I know what's going on now. Um, enemy score. Obviously here it's zero, one. Score of zero times multiplier one, which obviously gives me zero. By the time I come down here to create coin, it's just giving, it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is zero times one, putting it in there. So what I need to do is wait. Um, Increment the stage scores. 
alarm one. Okay, I could put it in there. I can put it in here because um, it'll be one step later after all those values are set. Because on that very first step, it just got created, so it's just using the default values. So now it should actually give me a proper point value. Uh, Neozoom helped me out. I should, I should be faster on looking over at the chat. I just I just get involved here, and then I kind of let this go. But Neozoom mentioned, uh, yes, if you use text, you should use string, and then you're variable to do it. And uh, you got it. Yes, I did get it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, my mind is a little bit off, I think, because it was like two weeks since the last show. So just kind of forget to cast it as a string. Stupid, stupid mistake on my part, but thank you for catching it. That's actually extremely Three, helpful when you guys seven, do that for me. And coin score was 300 down here. You can kind of see it, I suppose, uh, in the debug. So I think it is proper now. That coin will disappear. But let's see if we can grab this one. That one should be worth 300 when I pick it up. So my score after should be 900. Yes. Yep. OK, good. Uh, so the coins are now worth points, proper points. It's not just always 100. So I can set the coin value from the outside. Next step might be to change the color based on the value. That would be something. So let's see, probably similar situation. I'm not going to know what this coin score is until a step later. This one's kind of tricky because if I wait that step, what's going to happen if the player picks it up before they reach that step. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter too much because, well, no, it would matter. No, it would matter. Well, it's it's all being set in the same step. Yeah, it's just kind of tricky. What I'm, what I'm thinking here is since I don't want to just wander around in my own head, I want to actually show you guys what I'm thinking here. What I'm wondering right now is uh, when this coin appears, it's created. That's a horrible coin, by the way. It starts out with a score of zero uh, in the frame it's created. In that same frame, you know, later on down the line, uh, the score thing sets this to its proper score, which is like 300, for example. So all I'm kind of worried about is what if the player collects that coin the same instant it gets created? It's going to come down to like the the execution order, I suppose, like where collision events are in terms of when they get calculated versus the instance create and then the stuff that's going on in between. It'd be almost impossible to check because I would have to be right on top of it when the coin appears. But don't think I can get away with doing it safe because I am creating the instance in a frame later setting the point values. So there is a delay. There's definitely a delay. There is one frame where this coin is worth zero points. Hmm. I guess what I could do... This is a bit hacky, so it's probably not the best way to do it. But what I could do is... only make the coin disappear if it has a point value. So if the player runs into it and it's still zero, then nothing happens is one way I could go about it. So I would have to modify the pickup player thing. Yeah, let, let's do it that way. It's the safest way to do it for now anyway, unless I think of something better. So let's override the collision with the player and only if, only if coin score is greater than zero, then destroy. Just to make sure, because you could imagine if a player 
puts all their heart and soul into you know blasting an enemy to grab a coin and it's worth zero points so that would be extremely frustrating so I do not want to do that so let's comment that so I remember what this does only allow the player to pick up the coin if it's worth points and that happens a frame later so last week or two weeks ago I figured out in Game Maker that the collision events just keep firing every time so what's gonna happen is if it's worth zero points the player is going to overlap with it it's gonna fire off a collision event the player is gonna get plus equal zero points which is fine just leave it at that but the coins gonna stay there and then a frame later the player is still gonna be on top of the coin and then the the values in here are actually going to be set so the player does get the points and the coin disappears so that should work should uh, so that prevents that problem now uh, the next thing is going to be set an alarm to change the color since now all I have to worry about is color so just one one step that's fine I wish there was just a wait because I would throw it in there but there isn't so Add event alarm zero. And make sure I'm not overriding anything. Okay, so I use alarm one, two, three. Let's use four then. Just just to be just to be on the safe side. Four. Okay. And in here is where I want to change the color. So it starts off with just that generic white one, but then it'll change the color based on the point values. Probably should use script here as well, but uh, let's see. Neozum says, I gotta go, but I'll check in later on the next section. Uh, next sessions, your game looks pretty cool already. Keep it up, man. Good luck. Thank you, Neozum. Uh, thank you for dropping by, and thank you for complimenting me on the game. Thank you for uh, the advice on the string and the advice on using scripting in Game Maker language. I hope you do drop by again, because it's very awesome having you. And PandaBits is talking about the points, so I should actually do that, because that's exactly where I'm going into right now. So Pandavitz mentions, have a minimum score, then have it so that your score goes up to the minimum. It determines the values. Uh, say it's 50 points, as your score goes from 100 to 150, 110, 120, 130. Set value would give it more than enough time to do determine value. Yeah, yeah, that's an idea too. Let me, well, I keep, I keep a log of the chat, so I'm going to think about that one. And PandaBits, thank you for covering me on the time thing. Uh, it is down below in the Twitch feed. There is a little map that shows like the times in terms of like daylight savings time versus standard time. And it does show when the show starts. So thank you for covering me, PandaBits, because don't check the chat every... I need to have like something up here, up here, so I can always just see your messages as soon as they pop up. That would make life a lot easier. I wonder if I can do that. I'll have to think about some way I can get the chat up here instead of over there but let's see jumping back into this uh, if it's worth 100 so coin score equals 100 actually I think I will use script for this one so I can get away with a switch statement it'll be much easier it'll be much cleaner so score switch but panda bits could you explain uh, what you were suggesting just a little bit more uh, because it might it might be a really good idea, but I'm just not grasping it. So if you could explain it a little more, maybe I could get away with not having to do all the extra stuff with the collision checks and all that. So let's see. If the coin is the base 100, let's just keep the blend as it is. So image blend. Global C64 purple. Obviously, I won't want to use purple for 100, but just for now. And let's think of our currency. Um, if an enemy explodes in 500 points, would I want five 100 coins, or would I want one 500 coin, or would I want to have 250 point coins, like a quarter? Like this is a dime. Let's get it up there. This is a dime. This is a quarter. Let's see. What else can I do? Is, you know, probably what's going to make 
it the most interesting is if I have a situation like this. You know, the enemy gets killed. Blam, the enemy gets killed. You know, coins start flying out of them. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here in the end. You know, it'd be nice if this happened as opposed to, you know, the enemy dies and just one coin drops out. That's kind of boring. So even if they're worth just 100 points, it'd probably be nice to have, you know, two or three coins dropping out that are just worth less. Try to get it balanced so that there's always, you know, three to five coins flying out of enemies, maybe two to five coins flying out of enemies. So let's see, 50, 250, because I think in terms of my multipliers, I'm always going to have hundreds. So 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. So if, as long as I have 50, it's going to make sure that there's always at least two coins, right? But I don't want to have too many. I don't want to just have like some enemy explode in like 100 coins that fills the screen, although that would be kind of cool. Uh, let's see what else could we do. 550, 750? 750 would be an interesting coin. Let's see, there are enemies that are worth a lot of points. So let's say you killed something that was worth a thousand points and had a 20 multiplier on it, that'd be 20,000. So theoretically, you could get 20,000 points off of one enemy. So I need something to divide that so that there aren't too many. Let me just, because my brain is slow right now, let me just rely on the calculator. So that would be 26 coins. That's no good. Um, 2,500. I guess I could have a 5,000, 2,500. 2,500 coin. That would be a super rare coin, by the way. What else could I do? 500 coin, 2,500 coin. I mean, theoretically, there could be a, an enemy in a way that you kill them that's worth 2,500, so one coin could appear, which isn't good, but uh, can't help that too much. 5,500. This is a very weird currency. It's actually designed to not be efficient. So. You're nor normally, when a country is designing a currency, they want people to use as few coins as possible in terms of number because coins take resources and everything else to make. In this case, we want to have an, a good number of coins. And PandaBits mentions uh, is explaining uh, his suggestion from earlier. So on coin pickup, the coin already has a base value, which will be added to the coins as to as the coins value is determined so that you don't need to worry about picking up the coin and it being worth nothing. Uh, the coin's value is always set. You pick up the coin, and on ticket increases your score value by a set amount. As the coin ticks, its value underscores. Okay. So, yeah, all right. I see what you're saying. So make the coin worth, say, like 100, just as a default. And then when you pick it up, uh, just have it, before it gets destroyed, just kind of have it tick those extra values into your into your score. That's actually not a bad idea. Let's write that down. Wrote it down. Um, going to keep that in mind because that could be another solution. Uh, if I do find this getting weird, then that's one way to do it. I at the moment, I'm suspecting that one frame of the coin not being picked up as it is now because the coin just won't get picked up for just that frame that it gets created, so it'll it'll at least have time to appear before the player can pick it up, which is probably a good thing anyway. So I'm going to I'm gonna run with this one for now, but I will keep that in mind if this one's not turning out the way I want it to be. And Pandavit says score on initial pickup. 50 ticks, yeah, and theoretically I'm not a coder. But yes, your idea was actually really, really good. So even though you say you're not a coder, uh, that's actually a really, really good idea. So thank you for that. And if I can spell break. So hopefully this currency is very inefficient. It should be. So now if I do have an enemy that's worth 20,000 points, 
it, they'll break apart into, well, one 5,500 coin, another 5,500 coin, another 5,500 coin, and then a 2,500 coin, and then a 750 coin, and then a 250 coin. So yeah, they'll break apart into about, you know, five or six coins. I mean, they should break apart in a lot of coins. If you killed an enemy that's worth that many points, it's probably worth it. So now let's set the colors. Um, yeah, it'd be nice if they match kind of the bullet colors as well. Because up here in the sprites, you'll be able to see it better. Probably. Dark bullet, light bullet. Bullet drops. Maybe I have to go to the bullet object to show you what I'm talking about here. Stab. Bullet bounce check. Okay, there we go. So, uh, in the game itself, when the bullet's first fired, it's gray. Then it bounces enough and it turns to kind of a cyan color. As you can see there, global cyan. Then it moves up to yellow, then it moves up to tan, red, white. It does have that outline, so it does stand out against the background when that happens. I should follow this in terms of value, uh, so that the player can learn what you know what's valuable in the game. If you think about the Olympics, for example, you have bronze, silver, gold. Uh, so whatever happens, if as long as you use those colors, like a lot of games use those colors as is, for example. Uh, they just use you know bronze for third place, silver for second, gold for first because players understand what that means thanks to the Olympics. Um, so whatever kind of value system I use in this in terms of colors, you know having gray be my my bronze and having you know white be my gold or you know just keep that consistent so that the bullet bounces. As the bullet gets worth more, the coins get worth more, kind of keep that same color shifting going. That's how I want to do it. I probably don't want to actually just have a gray. So let's start with cyan. Let's keep this, this as similar as possible. Just so that the player can eventually understand what those colors mean. So if, I, if I'm just arbitrary with it, it's not going to make any sense. But through playing the game, they know that a cyan bullet is worth more than a gray bullet. And they know that a yellow bullet is worth more than a cyan bullet. So, yellow, tan, I think after tan, which is really just orange, uh, is red. And then for this bad boy, if someone gets up to this, it should just be white. Hopefully they stand out against the background. Hopefully. Let's see. This is only good for now. I'm going to have to actually break the coin, break the score up into proper coins. So I'm going to need an algorithm to do that, but that can't be inside a coin because this is where it's getting made. Coin color. So I don't need that. I don't need that. So it's no longer going to be purple. So determine coin color. Now I have to break the coins up into proper coins based on this. So create coin now has to get a little more complicated. So, you know, like what you saw me doing with the calculator, I have to now do in code. Like if I had an enemy that gave me 300 points, you know, I shot him with a... Uh, a yellow bullet, they were worth 100 points, it gave me a multiplier of 3 for 300 points. You know, I'd have to have an algorithm that shaves off 250, makes a coin worth 250, and then makes another coin worth 50, and stops. Uh, it should be easy enough, theoretically. So let's see, local... Wait. Do I? I don't think I use locals. It's var. See, there we go. I'm getting my scripting languages mixed up. Var score count coin score. How what what can I call this thing to actually make it make sense to me? Score count. 
count. Let's just call it score count and make that equal to score times multiplier to start with. So if it's worth 300 points, this will be 300. And then we have to go into a giant if else statement. Uh, if score count is greater than 5,500, greater than or equal to, let's just go with greater than. That way I can guarantee that I get two coins out of everything. Um, then create a coin. And this is also going to have to be a loop. So while score count is greater than zero, loop through this stuff. And I don't need the debug message anymore. OK. And just make that worth 5,500. Finish off the wall loop. And start doing all the other ifs. So let's go up to coin, see where that is. Where is it? Coin. Determine coin color. Let me just drag this whole thing over there for reference. Oops, don't want to get rid of that. So I'll keep it down there for reference. So 5,500, 2,500, 2,500, 2,500, 2,500. What's next? 75, 75, oops, 75, 75. I think next was 250. 250, 250, and last is 50. And since nothing's worth less than 100 points, uh, the 50 should be able to round out the, the number of coins popping out. And actually, let's make this one greater than or equal to 50. And I also need to subtract something. I need to subtract 5,500 from score count to make sure that I don't just keep spawning coins forever. and end up in an infinite loop. Five, 25, and last is 50. 50, okay. So theoretically, this should break that score down into the proper number of coins. Uh, I'm not gonna actually make them move, so they're all gonna be right on top of each other for now but collecting them should give the proper score if I did everything right. So that'll be the first step, making sure that happened. It's gonna be really hard to tell when the coins are just right on top of each other whether Ready, they're working or not. <laughs> and no coins are spawning, so that's... As far as I can tell. Oh, okay, a white coin spawned. Why did a white coin spawn? 300. Okay. I'm not doing that properly. Enemy score. Create coin. So it was greater than 300. Instance create, coin score 250. There should have been a 250 coin in there. And when it got to this, it should have changed it to a yellow color, but it did not. Hmm. Okay, we need a debug message in here, I think. Debug message. Coin. coin created. Uh, let's go with string. Keep track of the coin score, I guess. This should at least give me a hint. Whoops, it's off screen. This debug message should give me a hint as to what's going on. Because whatever's happening, it's not coming into here. So I think it's still it's trying to make this thing worth 300. And that's not what I want to have happen, but I want to make sure that that's the case. 
And Penavitz mentions round to a value and split the remainder. Uh, round down to a value, then split the difference. Yeah, uh, that's basically what kind of that if else is doing. It's just kind of picking, you know, the equivalent of like dimes, nickels, quarters, and kind of taking each one of those away and then moving on to the next one until, you know, trying to be as efficient as possible using an inefficient currency to break that number down. And Cirrus mentions that some coins should be made out of chocolate. Ah, uh, nasty white chocolate. Ah, oh, Cirrus said that maybe the white coins are nasty white chocolate. See, you do not like white chocolate. I love white chocolate, so I have to disagree on that one. I would love to have a white coin made of white chocolate. Although it is probably, you know, heresy to actually call white chocolate white chocolate because it's not chocolate. Ready, set, draw. But I still love this stuff. But chocolate coins would be awesome. Okay, uh, here's a problem. I think I figured out what's wrong. <laughs> here's what's wrong. Uh, I forgot to change alarm 0 to alarm 4. Uh, the reason is didn't get any debug message. So that whole, you know, picking the color thing wasn't working. That's all that was going on there. So now it should be working. Theoretically. Hopefully it changes the color. Ready, set, so why debug messages are so helpful. Okay. Let's let's pause and take a look here. Because it's working. That first enemy is always worth 300 points because you get the bounce and it hits them. It said coin created 250, coin created 50. 300 is breaking out into a 250 coin and a 50 coin. So that is working properly. Uh, the last one, well, let's see, the yellow one is the one that seems to be standing out on top, but there should be tw two coins there. When I pick them both up, it should give me 300 points when I go over them. Same with this guy. Although he'll be worth more points, right? 300, okay, he'll be worth 300 too. So let's go over there and grab our points. Yes, it's working. It's working, but all the coins are right on top of each other, so you can't see the fact that there are multiple coins. But the system's working, and that's what counts. So the last thing is going to be to have those coins actually not be right on top of each other. That'll be the next step, but I do need to take a break because my voice is dying on me. Thank you for waiting while I took that quick break. Um... For those of you who didn't catch the intro, this is Blue Tango's live game development show, uh, where we show everything that goes into making a game from concept to completion. Uh, all of the informa information about where you can find us is in the Twitch info down below. Uh, but just in case, we're at www.bluetango.com, uh, BTango on Twitter, Facebook.com, Blue Tango Studio, YouTube.com, Blue Tango Studio, for those of you watching the live stream with me now, and Twitch TV, Blue Tango, for those of you watching us later on YouTube. Uh, we're making Project Spaghetti, which is a top-down 2D cowboy shooter where the bullets fire bounce around the screen with the pinball mechanic. And before the break, I got it up to... well, let's let's go over to the task list. I think I actually forgot to go over the task list this morning, so let's do that really quick. It was simple tasks, so it's no big deal, but uh, episode 37, enemies, enemies, exploding coins, and if there's a coin rough sprite. Obviously, the, the rough sprite is there. It's... It's as rough as rough gets. It's basically a circle that is done. It is rough. Um, and right now it's just working on the exploding part. Uh, enemies do break apart into coins now. Uh, the score does break down into different coins as well. But still need to actually have the coins move. Otherwise they're all just stacked upon each other. And uh, Panavits, we were talking in the break a little bit. Uh, still working on the textures. And... Panavitz mentioned that the element-based approach is going okay. My bigger problem is the fact that I need to make them through something like GIMP, which aren't great for making shiny things. One of my issues is I don't know how to export a full texture map from 3ds Max effectively. Yeah, I wish I could help you there. I can't. The only two programs I've ever worked in are just Maya and Blender, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't know how to do textures in either of those anyway, because it's been so long since I've done anything. Uh, if anybody watching this does know how to use 3ds Max and can help Pandabits, uh, definitely be awesome if you could tell them um, or help them out. And I hope it, I hope you do figure it out. Uh, 
Yeah, because I remember like in Blender having to break textures out and trying to draw them and stuff like that. And it just, nah. It's probably why I liked just making 2D games, I guess, because all the textures and 3D modeling and stuff, it just, it's probably not for me. I do not have the talent for it. I don't have the talent for 2D art either, but at least it's it gets done, I suppose, with pixel art. But let's see if we can get those coins moving um, in the next 15 minutes or so. So when a coin spawns, it can't just spawn in place. It has to have some kind of movement going. Uh, whether to set the movement from here inside of enemy score or set it within the coin itself is the question, but maybe let's try in the coin itself for now. It might be too random setting it in here, but let's give it a shot. If I can remember what the, the random thing is, I think it's I random. I random. Game maker. I think the function is I random for integer random. Yes. Okay, so it goes from zero to the number that you put in the parentheses. So if I want 360 degrees, I should probably go 359, obviously. Um, so I can set the direction. To I random 359. So that'll change the direction that it's facing uh, into one of 360 degrees. And then I actually have to get it moving. So speed, but it's a speed that has to decay over time. That's going to be interesting. I guess, yeah, I guess I could just keep calling an alarm over and over again to kind of reduce the speed. So let's try that. Now this should also be somewhat random so all the coins don't just fire off in some uniform speed. Hmm. Let's see. High random it should be should be a random speed. There should be a max speed though. So coin speed. Let's make that a global well, not a global variable, a constant. Let's make that a constant so I can adjust it later. My random coin speed. So zero to the coin speed. Should probably add something to it so it's not just going to stay in place. But let's add coin speed first. And what's a good speed? Player. Trying to find a good speed to compare it with here. Dodge distance. BL base speed. So the bullet speed is three for the slowest bullet. So three would be a nice maximum, maybe. Let's just try. Let's do go with three. Let's do that. And let's just add one to that. Let's subtract the one in here and then add it on the outside to make sure that it always has some speed. And we also have to set an alarm, a new alarm, because I don't want to use alarm 4 again. So this has to be alarm 5. And every couple of steps the speed should go down. Let's just do every step, keep it simple. Alarm 5. So this should reduce the speed. Speed minus some fixed value. And it should be clamped. So if speed is greater than 0, so if it has speed, then call this alarm again. Otherwise, don't. And I do need to clamp that so that it doesn't go below zero. So let me check the clamp thing. Clamp game maker. Clamp. Okay. There's just it's just called clamp. 
So what this does is it'll take that variable and make sure that it's always within a certain range. It's not going below or above it. Uh, the above I don't need to worry about too much. The below I do need to worry about. The above can just be coin speed. It's never going to happen because it's always subtracting, so it's not a big deal. Let's see if that works. It may actually just work. Uh, let's give it a shot, though. And uh, Panabits did mention uh, Maya is similar to 3ds Max. The two of them have very similar uses with different specialties. Maya is for animation, 3ds is for object building. Yeah, even though I always use Maya for object building. For some reason, that's what we use because that's what all the animators do like. So we just kind of all, on the teams I've been on, we've just all used Maya because it's just kind of the one, the package that everyone can understand. And Noob drops by. Hey, Noob. Uh, thank you for dropping by. Uh, Friction is built into Game Maker. It's like double blue arrow, I think, under the Move tab. Let me check that out. Okay, so Friction. Let me also see if there's a script inside of it for friction. Thank you. That would actually be awesome, because then I wouldn't have to worry about alarms and steps and all that stuff. So game maker, friction, game maker, friction. There we go. Noob, you always save the day. Thank you. Um, and thank you for dropping by just at the right time. And uh, Panabit says, looks like you might not check in time. Might get destroyed by... Just get destroyed by physics. Ah, oh, not gonna have hilariously flat, fast coins. Well, I guess I could try to have hilariously fast coins just once, just to see what it looks like. And instead of using clamp, use max, since you don't care about maximum speed. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so two good ideas from Noob that I should just jump right into. Let's do that. So yeah, I don't need to use clamp. I can just use max. Good idea. Uh, or min. Max, max, yeah, max, yeah, of course, max. The highest of the two, whether it's zero or minus zero. Yes, okay. Thank you. Noob for the win, always for the win. Thank you. Um, and then friction. Let me just check what that does. Uh, slow the instance down when screen is zero. Blah, 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 blah. Perfect. Okay. I don't need to do any of this. Although you helped me with the max thing, I don't really need to do this. That is awesome. That is awesome. Friction. Let's do it. Friction. Okay, uh, since I was doing point 0.1, let's just do that point 0.1. Don't need this alarm anymore. Don't need this anymore. And let's see if that works. Uh, thank you so much. This should do something. Hopefully the coins do slow down over time. I do need to get this browser window out of the way because that gray is kind of distracting. Let's see what happens. First, let's see if the coins actually explode anywhere. Hopefully they move. Yes! <laughs> the movement is terrible, but they do move. Obviously it's just linear movement, so it's it's not going to be very exciting. <laughs> but the coins do fall out of the enemies and go in different directions. And they are the proper colors. Uh, the, the signs are worth 50 points. So collecting two of those got me 100 points. These ones should give me 500 points. Oops, if I can get to them before they disappear. And take me up to 1,200. Awesome. Uh, I think I'm missing a sound effect. Am I? I don't think I heard a sound effect when I picked them up. Okay, yeah, I need, I need to add this to the coin as well. And it is a coin pickup sound effect, so that should work fine. Um, so friction works perfectly. Uh, just have to make it a curve, not, not just linear friction. Um, so I may have to do the alarm thing in the end anyway, but you can worry about that later. They are coming out. You know, obviously, the ideal would be... 
oops, not calc, uh, paintbrush. The ideal would be, you know, the coin flies out fast and then stops. It's, you know, especially if I could animate it and actually have it feel like it's jumping up. It might be kind of hard because there's no shadows or anything to indicate that, but you know, in terms of the curve, it should start out fast and then kind of slow down. Otherwise, it just it just literally looks like something's moving in kind of a one direction. Uh, friction should have been kind of doing that. Maybe it's better to set the speed really high and the friction high too. That could solve some of that. Let's let's go with what Pandavits wanted to see. And let's try a ridiculously high coin speed. And so let's try setting the friction higher. And see what that does. And Benavit says, do the coins move in the first place yet? Yes, they do. They are moving. And Noob mentions, use your method as before, but multiply by like 0 0.9 or something. Yeah, that's actually a good idea, because if you multiply by 0 0.9, it will, it will turn into a curve. Let's see what it looks like with ridiculously fast coins and friction. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. <laughs> well, there was a ridiculously fast coin that came flying at me. Um, yeah, obviously, because I'm using just the random, uh, the range of the coin speeds goes from 0 to, like, 30. So some coins just dribble out and stop really fast, while other coins just go... <laughs> across the screen, which is interesting, I suppose, but probably not not good for the final thing. Uh, let's just go with 5 for now, and maybe set the friction to 0.2, just as an experiment. Let's see what this is. But, you know, in, in the end I might go with uh, Noob's second suggestion, which is to multiply by 0.9, because that's actually a really good idea. Well, let's just see what it looks like. Ready, set, draw. And if this works, there's just one more thing I need to do. Well, that's that's not too bad. It doesn't feel like a coin, so I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit. Uh, part of the problem is that they're sliding, obviously. Um, if they had shadows, you could kind of get an arc feel to them, where they're like jumping up in the air and kind of bouncing down and stopping. That would be the ideal, rather than this kind of slide thing that's going on. But I'll think about that for now. What I do need to do is have the coins not uh, slide inside of the air or something. So there's one more thing I need to do with the coins, and that's add collision stuff. Uh, just like the bullet. Uh, when the bullet slams into like a bumper or a border, it bounces. So I need to do the bounce for bumper and border to make sure that it doesn't go off screen. That'd be horrible. Imagine that. You you waste an enemy that's worth a lot of points and all the co coins go flying off the screen so you can't collect them. That would be awful. So let's not do that. Uh, so bumper, bumper, generic bumper, and bounce, 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 bounce. This one. Yeah, I don't need precisely, and bumpers are solid, so that's fine. And collision, bumpers, border, the edge of the screen, same thing. And let's just make sure this works. Because if it does, we are on getting off to the right start with this stuff. Hopefully I can shoot an enemy in a way that makes the coin bounce into a barrel. These guys are a little far away, so it might not do anything. Okay, well, let's just collect those. It is a lot more fun collecting coins than just getting points, which is cool. Uh, let's see if I can shoot an enemy to the edge of the screen, maybe. Yes, all oh, the 
the coins are working. Um, because I'm trying to collect them, I'm making more mistakes, which is actually a good thing. Um, risk reward, you know. Yes, okay, that coin seemed to slide to a stop here. It bounced a little bit. I think it's working. Obviously, that's something I need to solve. Uh, I want to make sure that the player has time to collect the coins before the game ends, so I need to check if there are coin instances before starting the whole you know, game over sequence. But I'll put that in the task list. Okay, yeah, it looks like the coins are properly... Well, Properly bouncing off of things so that they're not getting stuck in places that the player can't reach, which is good. Okay, good. Um, so let me, before I forget all the things that I still need to do, let me jump over to the task list and add those things. So, uh, we do have enemies exploding in coins, so that's cool. Uh, the coins are, well, there's a very rough sprite in there, but I uh, still need to do a couple of things. Uh, for example, I'll just do it in progress here. One thing I need to do is make sure that, the, well, let's see, game over, level over. Don't move to next level if there are coins. The coins disappear over time anyway, so it's not a big deal if the player's just kind of stuck on the screen and a coin doesn't go away, because it will eventually go away if there are coins. But that's something we have to do, because that'd be really disappointing. Like, say you have a boss, you shoot the boss, all these coins fly out, it's time to collect them, and then all of a sudden you get the results screen. It's like, what's going on there? No one's going to like that, so let's not do that. This will be a task for later, maybe a brush-up task, but the coin appearance animation? It needs to be brushed up because it is just sliding out, which is kind of weird. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to do. Let's see if I can remember what it was. And the noob mentioned something. That's actually something I should look up. Uh, noob mentions that you can check the window if the window loses focus and pause when that happens. That is actually a really good idea, because this is a really high, you know, frantic action kind of game, so obviously if the user clicks outside of it, they want they want to pause. There's no reason they would not want to, as far as I can tell, so that's actually a good idea. I will add that to the task list. And Sears mentions that it should explode like a fountain. Yeah, that's, that's actually exactly what I want to do. Um, it's going to be kind of tough, because the sprites are very basic, the colors are very basic, and there's no shadows. So, you know, what's going to happen is, even though, you know, theoretically I want the coin to feel like it's kind of going up in the air and then coming down, because if I don't have shadows or something like that going on, it's just going to look like the coin's doing this weird, like, sliding arc. Instead of sliding straight, it's sliding in a weird direction. Uh, it's going to feel like it's always on the ground, so I'm going to have to think about that. Maybe add shadows, fake shadows or something. That's going to be tricky. In fact, that's going to be very tricky, so let me move that up to 1.5 hours for that one. I could swear there was something else I needed to do. Uh, coins explode, that's fine. They come out of the enemy, that's fine. The animations are weird. Let's see. I'll have to I'll have to try and remember what it was I was going to add to the task list. It feels like there was something else. Let me just play it one more time, just to check, because I do have to get going here for the doctor's appointment. But don't want to leave this kind of undone. So let me do. Uh, Ready, sorry, there, I screwed up the resolution with the window resize, but it should be okay. They do bounce, that's fine. Collect the coins, they make sense, that's fine. Oh! I remember what I have to do. Yes, because I'm still giving you points when you kill the enemy, uh, but now there's extra coins coming out. 
Although, um, kind of doing both is not bad because uh, it gives you half your points at the moment, half your points, potential points, for just killing the enemy, but to get your full potential, you have to go around and collect the coins. Kind of dividing it up like that's not a bad idea because it gives players kind of a small reward if they still get enemies killed, but they can't collect the coins. But if you want to go for the points, you have to, like I was doing, take the risks and get yourself shot uh, to grab the coins. Doing both is actually not too bad. I might just leave it like this for now. Let me just keep it in the task list as a question. Uh, let's put it over here in notes. Should I get rid of automatic points and only give points through coins? What do you guys think? Um, if you were playing, if you were playing this game, which system would you prefer? You know, obviously with leaderboards and stuff, um, since everyone's going to fall under the same rules in terms of how many points you get in the game, it's not going to make a difference because everyone's going to be bumped up the same way. Because obviously with using both, you get double the points, but uh, it's just whether it feels better to kind of have that potential points or whether it's better to only, well, whether it's better to have only potential points or automatic points and potential points. What do you guys think? And uh, Noob's going to take off to do some homework. Uh, glad you could give some ideas and help. Thank you. Yeah, the show's just wrapping up, so uh, you're not going to miss anything, which is cool. Uh, good luck on your homework, and thank you for the help. And yeah, Sirius mentioned that Shadows would help to, make, to see the coins better. And uh, games like Geometry Wars do do that, so that's actually a good idea. You know what? Play Geometry Wars again. It has been a while, so I'm going to do that. So that might, might, might be great inspiration. And <laughs> Noob mentions, by the way, nice name, Panda Bits. Yes. And you have very many handles on the net. Yeah, because I didn't know, like, for example, who you were on YouTube when I saw that comment. You know, the comment a while ago on YouTube where you mentioned having kind of that random, you know, uh, challenge room idea on one of the YouTube videos. I didn't know it was you. I thought it was just someone watching the, the YouTube videos that made that comment. So now that I know it's you, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, you have a lot of, you do have a lot of handles. I think I've got them all in my head now. So I know who you are in the different places. And new benchins to keep both. Otherwise, new nervous players will leave with a score of zero. Okay, yeah. Good idea, and Panda Bits did mention the Geometry Wars thing, so I think, I think, yeah, let's let's keep it. Let's do both. Let's do both. You guys are right. Let's do them both. So that was episode 37. I am going to wrap up so I can make my doctor's appointment, but did get the coins in the game. Do have them exploding, sort of. They slide out. They're worth different points. And they're broken down properly, you collect them, it adds to your score, so now there's a little bit more of a risk-reward system in the game, which is good news. By the way, Trello, uh, if you search Trello and Project Spaghetti, you can come to this task list anytime you want. Let me just kill a few enemies here, just for fun. Yes, yeah, alright, there, there the coin bounce was obvious. It's using the same kind of bullet bounce system that the bullets do, so that the coins don't get lost off the screen, which is good. Let's try an alien. Okay, yep, enemies explode in coins too. Awesome. Got it done! Thanks to you guys. Uh, thank you, you know, Panavit, Cirrus, Noob. Uh, thank you, all of you guys. Jamorian, thank you for all stopping by and giving some great advice. Um, Arkin. And Cirrus mentioned did a lot of work today. Yes, did get a lot of work done today. 
feels good. I do have to work on that animation. If I can figure out a way to get the shadows working properly, I might try that. As obviously, ideally, you know, any game you want to have coins kind of flying up in the air and then coming down. That would that would be much, much better feeling than just sliding everywhere. So I'll think about ways to do that. But uh, that will wrap me up for today's episode. Thank you know, thank you guys, by the way, for putting up with me going to GDC last week. I did put an article up on the site, uh, bluetengu.com, kind of going over what I did in the game design workshop, which was awesome, by the way. Uh, that was probably my my high point for GDC was that attending that workshop for two days. Uh, had a lot of ver veteran game designers that would kind of stand up and you know give give some of their advice, but most of it was hands on. It was mostly you know try to make games using playing cards or you know for example the table I was at did like a Spelunky game like try to recreate the feeling that you get in the game Spelunky through just you know index cards and dice and things like that. It was actually very, very educational. Um, two things were educational about it. One was, uh, without having to worry about tools and all that stuff, you could focus on really getting the gameplay going, and you could iterate on it really quick, because all you had to do was just change cards out, change the rules out, and you already had it going. You just had to play another game to try it. You know, Usually when you're working with Unity or Unreal or Game Maker Studio, you know, to get something done takes, obviously like today, to get coins done took you know an hour and a half takes time, but if you're just doing it on paper, it's really quick. That was educational. The other thing that was educational was actually the way groups kind of work together. Obviously, everyone starts out at the same level because none of us know each other. Get into groups of five or six, kind of cluster up and uh, go to work. And it was interesting because some groups, well, to be honest, some groups worked better than others. Um, no fault of anyone. It's just some work better than others. Usually the ones that worked really, really well, I mentioned this on the article on the site, uh, the ones that worked really well were the ones where everyone kind of had the same amount of speaking time. And this has been true in like any dev teams that I've been on before, but usually when everyone gets a say, and if there's not this whole top-down thing or one person that's always talking, when you can avoid that, uh, usually the games are much, much better. Problems get exposed much, much faster. It's efficient. Everyone's happy. It's usually when you have just one person that's always talking or you have one person who's, you know, always throwing the negative things out there, you know, like, well, well that's not going to work, that's not going to work. All it takes is just one person like that and just suddenly everything just kind of <laughs> falls apart. And, you know, even in small groups for just a limited amount of time got to see that in action and it was awesome. And there was actually another speech that kind of talked about that in terms of, like, game studios. Uh, efficient game studios are ones where you know, everyone gets kind of an equal say and everyone gets to contribute. And it's all kind of related to collective IQ, where it's like, even if you have the smartest people in the world, if they don't work together well, uh, they'll actually perform less well than a group that just always talks. Like they said, you know, someone did research, I think Anita Woolley, Dr. Anita Woolley did research on it, collective IQ or collective intelligence. If you look that up, very interesting stuff. Uh, but wrote more detail on the site, so if you're interested in that stuff, definitely check it out. Uh, thank you for watching our game development show, and thank you for, you know, showing up two weeks after the break. I did miss you guys. It was awesome to be back. I'm kind of out of the flow of things, even after just a week of being out, as you can tell, but hopefully I'll get, I'll get back into it next week. And you can catch past episodes in this one over at www.youtube.com, Blutingu Studio. If you're watching this later on YouTube, come drop at the live show we do every week on Twitch TV Blue Tengu. Uh, if you drop, if you come to Twitch TV Blue Tengu, down at the bottom there is a map that shows the times. Day daylight savings time did happen for those of you in North America, so I'll we'll need to remember a whole new set of times here when I'm sp spitting them out. But remembering that we have to spring forward, here goes. In fact, I think I was giving the wrong times before, so these are kind of the same times, but I think it's four to six Pacific. 5 to 7 Mountain, 6 to 8 Central, 7 to 9 Eastern. Let me know if that's not right. Uh, and then if you're in the UK, it starts at 11 p.m. Friday night and goes until 1 a.m. Saturday morning. If you're in Japan with me, it's just 8 to 10 Saturday morning, so there's no daylight savings time in Japan. So it's always 8 to 10. And in Australia, it starts anywhere from 7 to 10, depending on where you live, and it starts at 12 in New Zealand. Uh, all of those times from Japan on are for Saturday all the times for UK and North America are Friday, thanks to the world being a big place. 
But we always announce what we're doing through Twitter, so follow Btengu to keep track of when the live show starts or episodes go up, or follow us on Twitch or YouTube. Uh, the announcements should come through. And of course, you can see what we're up to anytime over at bluetengu.com. Uh, thank you, Sirius, Panovitz, Jamorian, Noob, all of you guys for stopping by and all the people that stopped by earlier. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.